Another of the glaring things to me about the film are the notable personalities of that defining period who were absent from the film. While it's understandable that they didn't have the screen time to include everyone from the golden era, it's a curious thought as to why some names were conspicuously left out of consideration. As with everything in bodybuilding, the malevolence of politics plays a hand in depicting who gets included in the small promotional limelight and who gets shut out. The original golden boy blonde bomber Dave Draper would have made a great inclusion due to his amazing look and his intellectual and philosophical take on the sport. Dave had been in a lawsuit with Weeder in 1975 which was settled out of court and so he was probably persona non grata by that time. Frank Zane was a regular at Gold's Gym and had beaten Arnold in Arnold's first competition in America. The two were well known to each other and often hung out with each other in social occasions, with Frank serving as Arnold's maths tutor for his business classes. Apparently footage of Zane was recorded but Zane withdrew his participation and consent when it was revealed that Arnold was the only bodybuilder who was being paid for his appearance. Why don't you call it Pumping Arnold? Frank told George Butler as Frank wisely calculated that the film was first and foremost a vehicle for showcasing Arnold's star potential, with everyone else playing second fiddle to Arnold's dominance. Mike Menser would go on to provide Arnold with one of his largest potential arch rivals in bodybuilding, but his bodybuilding star was still under construction in 1975. Sidelined by a severe shoulder injury between the years of 1971 to 1974, he took third to Robbie Robinson and Roger Callard in 1975's Mr. America contest, but he does make a blink and you'll miss him appearance in the opening scene of Pumping Iron. Speaking of the opening scene, the film begins with the introduction of an off-season and considerably smaller Arnold returning to the gym after a seasoned absence. Arnold had recently co-starred in Stay Hungry, playing none other than bodybuilder Joe Santo. Arnold had slimmed down at the director's ironic request that Arnold downsize for the role as the bodybuilder. So when Arnold enters the gym, we are introduced to a cast of nameless gym rats who, apart from being generally huge compared to gyms these days, are all in reverent awe of Arnold. I could never work out why Big Tony found Arnold's entrance so hilarious, putting his nervous laughter down to being uncomfortable on camera. But it's clear from Arnold's shirt that bookends both the beginning and the end of the film that it's an ironic foreshadowing that even this downsized Arnold is numero uno, no matter his fighting weight. Other notables include Sergio Oliva, who would have been a wonderfully ostentatious and flamboyant figure to present in this film. Having defeated Arnold, he too had an ego that rivaled Arnold's, and arguably a physique that overpowered him in many respects. However, Sergio was marginalized by the IFBB for his endless feuds with the powers that be, and having cast his lot in with a competitive organization, he was persona non grata among the Weeder regime. Dennis Tenorino was another charismatic bodybuilder, questionably absent from the lineup. Tenorino had just won the 1975 Mr. Universe and would have also made a great challenge to Arnold, in which he was very vocal in interjecting. Tenorino ran afoul of IFBB politics, who disqualified his entry based on a participation in a rival organisation, prompting him to assert, there's more corruption in bodybuilding than in the underworld. Serge Nubray, who was announced as an 11th hour entrant to the contest, also entails a complicated and controversial backstory. Serge was the then Vice President of the IFBB, second only to Ben Weeder, and he wielded some power in the organisation. But this didn't isolate him from some of the political manoeuvring that was to follow. In the four weeks period before the contest, Butler filmed Serge Nubray on his home ground in Paris. They asked him if they could use the footage in Pumping Iron for a fee of $200, telling him that they planned to present him as an Ali-style adversary, pitting him against Arnold. Nubray scuttled those plans by refusing to take a salary, and demanded instead the French distribution rights to Pumping Iron in exchange for using the footage of him in the film. Butler and Gaines wouldn't agree to his demands and altered their original concept. The plot thickened when Ben Weeder later recounted that New Braid tried to organise a last minute leadership coup with the fellow competitors. What was true was that New Bray had actually been disqualified two weeks earlier because of Ben Weeder's baseless claim that New Bray had been involved in porno films. Given that at the time New Bray was second in command of the IFBB and he had engineered the organisation of the contest in South Africa, it was bizarre as to why he was being barred from competing. The rumour was that Serge had been training hard with his eye on the title 
and he was fabulously conditioned and a legitimate threat to Arnold. He was asked by Ben Weeder to stand down for a year and he was promised the title in 76. But seeing the publicity surrounding the event, Serge refused and was subsequently disqualified, except for a last minute reprieve. More than likely to pad out would have been a two-man competition between Arnold and Fregno. With the finality of the contest, Nubray quit the IFBB and was officially banned for life when he started his own federation, which was Wabba. Serge went on to win the 76 Nabba Mr. Universe and did not reconcile with Ben Weider until Weider's imminent death almost 30 years later. As a subjective sport, bodybuilding is littered with the corpses of bad judging decisions. And many names spring to mind of those who've received the raw end of politically motivated poor placings, or the career-ending conspiratorial backroom wrangling by the powers that be. But when it comes to an entire career being screwed over by politics, however, it would be hard to go past the original giant killer, Danny Padilla. You might remember Danny from his cameo bit part in Pumping Iron, the young impressionable kid sitting in the quiet auditorium watching the under 200 pounders hit their poses on stage, chuckling with Arnold about Franco the Bat. Almost. Oh my god. Those guys are like animals, man. Can't oh, look at this one now, wait. See, this is to my father. Look at it. <laughs> you call him the Bat for long. Franco the Bat. <laughs> he could fly. Danny was supposed to be on that stage with the rest of those animals. If only cruel fate hadn't decreed that 15 minutes before getting on the bus to the show that he'd be pulled from the competitive lineup. Danny, who had trained and dieted for months, flew to South Africa, shot hours of footage with the pumping iron crew, was only to be informed at the last minute, sorry kid, we're only going to have a three-man team of Cats, Waller and Robinson. And you're out. Oh, but don't worry. You're young and you have a big future in front of you. Quick thinking Danny rallied and played his international heritage card and tried to join the Portuguese team who were delighted to have this rising star phenom on their team. The Brits and the Belgians, however, were having none of it and officially complained landing Danny back to square one and consequently out of the game. An additional bummer was that Danny had shot a lot of footage with the Pumping Iron crew, and to avoid creating any narrative confusion or embarrassment for the IFBB, Butler and Gaines decided to unceremoniously cut Danny's role down to the existing cameo role that we see today. And I come to find out later that it was Butler who said, why don't you let the little guy stay out and we can have Ken Waller and White Cats in the back, you know, fighting for the position. Yeah, that's part of the movie, yeah. Right. Well, it was basically, Pump and Iron did that. Mm, wow. So when I, I went to Ben Weeder, I said, Ben, what's going on here? And he's like, I don't, I, what do you mean? I, you got to take it up with the management. I don't know what's going on. I said, you're the president. You got to know everything. <laughs> right. And he said, that's just the way it's happened is. Uh -huh. so, I, so, yeah. so now I go to Oscar State, and he says to me, Dan, are you not competing? And I says, Oscar, somehow I got bumped. He said, how? That's not possible. You're a member of the team. So the guy from Portugal, the coach came by, and I said to him, uh, you don't have a guy in your short class, do you? And he could speak Spanish, and he says, no. I said, can I be on your team? Are you kidding me? Is this a joke? <laughs> and I said, no. So I said to Oscar, Oscar, I, I want to get on his team. Can I do this? Because he was the head of the European. Yeah. And he said to me, well, I don't know how we're going to do this, because he liked me. I said, Oscar, my mom was born in Spain, my dad was born in Puerto Rico, they had to go by Portugal to get it. <laughs> I said, well, story that stupid, I got to let you in. <laughs> so he got me in. So, so he let you in the team Portugal. Look at If you look at pictures, and you don't see very many, because it was an embarrassment for everybody. Right. I'm holding a banner and it says Portugal. It doesn't say USA. If you, you'll find it on the internet. If you look, you'll see it. That's when all the athletes come out on the stage. And right. They so we all carried a banner back then. Right. I've got a stick banner that says Portugal. And I don't <laughs> in front of me in the seats laughing his ass off. Oh my God. Nine eight. So now oh, I get right. on stage and I'm competing and I'm kicking everybody's butt. Yeah. I'm getting ready to win the universe. I was the winner. For and Portugal. they had a kid from England and somewhere else. And they protested. Somebody yeah. from England. And Oscar State was from England and he let me in. But one of the... the uh, one of these guys protested and okay. there was a big meeting and I got kicked out again. In previous videos, I spoke about the reasons for the notable absence of Joe Weider and Steve McCallick. But I was also wondering where that era's Boyer Co. was in the situation to the film's production. 
Winning the Mr. Orleans title while still in high school, along with 50 other competitions by the time Pumping Iron was filmed, Boyer was already a veteran, a prolific, charismatic and articulate personality in the sport, winning the Mr. America at 20 and competing alongside Arnold and other Pumping Iron alumni. Although winning the Mr. World and NABBA Pro Universe titles in 1975, I discovered that Boyer didn't join the IFBB Pro ranks until 1976, when he was directly invited by Arnold to compete at that year's Olympia. Boyer Co. also hailed from Alabama, the same state as Charles Gaines. So given the small bodybuilding scene at that time, it's a wonder why Boyer didn't enter on Gaines's radar or appear in the film. Boyer was also responsible for recommending the use of the Soundow Trophy, which would be later awarded for the first time to Frank Zane at the 1977 Olympia. There's so many other names that I could have loved to have seen in the film from that era, but I'll leave it to you in the comments. Who do you think deserves some more screen time? Or who do you think should have been featured in the film? Thanks again for watching, and don't forget to subscribe.